give it up for our leader, John Taylor. Let's thank God for him and his years, 25 years, doesn't look that old, 25 years, and bringing people together around coalition. And to all of you who are here, to my dear friend and sister, Stella Adams, amen. In the clip that you saw, Stella uh, ended up getting arrested with 15 other persons uh, because Speaker Tillis chose to arrest them at 4 o'clock in the morning rather than to meet with them. And she was defending a young lady who has cervical cancer who could be treated right now if we had accepted Medicaid expansion in North Carolina, who has said to me, Crystal Price is her name, every time you speak, call my name so that if I die, there will be video of you calling my name and my children will know that I did stand and fight for the right thing. So I've made that commitment um, to call her name. John is right, I'm on sabbatical because I believe in the middle of movements you must also meditate. You must think. Uh, this is not a season for just bumper sticker analysis. I really believe we're in the embryonic stages of a third reconstruction and whether or not it will be birth has a lot to do with how we understand what's going on. The first reconstruction, of course, was in the 1800s, 18, um, <clears throat> 1865 to the 1898. And it was only torn asunder by regret, regressive acts of immoral deconstruction. And if you look at that period of time, if you look at the 1954 to 68, the second reconstruction, America moved closer <clears throat> to being a more perfect nation but then that period of time was deconstructed by uh, immoral attacks on reconstruction. And if you look at, I don't have time this morning to work through all of it, but if you look at the attacks that happened to deconstruct reconstruction in the 1800s and to deconstruct reconstruction in the 1960s, you see the same attacks. It always started with the attack on voting rights, the attack on the courts, the attack on access to finance, and the attack on taxes, progressive taxes, and the attack on labor. Um, read sometimes how both of these seasons, and you will understand eerily how you are hearing re, re, uh, repositioned uh, the positions of the past that have always rose up to try to stop America from becoming a little closer to the promise of being a more perfect nation. I wanna think out loud, uh, the mic man's back, give me just a little bit of mic, my, my voice is a little weak this morning. I wanna think out loud um, this morning as a part of my sabbatical, because I've been wrestling with this question, so I want you to think with me this morning, help me figure this out. Marvin Gaye once said, what's going on? <laughs> and I wanna talk about what's going on. Loretta Lynch's, confirmation. Is it because she's black or is it about race? Now you might say, well, isn't black about, not necessarily. So let's wrestle a little bit. Now anytime you really want to understand what's going on, the Bible says where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Or where your treasure is, Reverend, that's where your heart is. So let's look at this GOP budget proposed. They just passed it in the House. It would cut $5 trillion over the next decade. Some touch your neighbor say $5 trillion. $5 trillion. Yeah. But when you look at the cuts, the overwhelming burden would fall on programs that boost working families, education, Medicare, Medicaid, college aid, job training, medical research, rebuilding roads and bridges. Many of those things which came out of the second reconstruction. Hmm. Tens of millions of Americans would lose their health insurance. Think about that. You're in Congress receiving free health care because you got elected by the people but then you vote to keep the people who elected you from having the same thing that you have because they elected you. What's going on? Millions would lose food stamps 
Millions would be priced out of college. Why is this crowd scared of our young people going to college? Hmm. The Republicans, or I like to say extremists, because they're not acting like Republicans. Lincoln was a Republican. He wouldn't be doing this. Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican. He wouldn't be doing this. Eisenhower wouldn't even do it, because Eisenhower said that funding public education was a matter of national security. So what's going on? And I think in a real sense, it's not about a balanced budget. That's the language, John, that they use because it sounds right to the public. It's, but it's cover language. It's, you, remember, you, remember, you remember that at the end of the Second Reconstruction, um, Kevin Phillips, who was the strategist for, for Richard Nixon, said, I know how we can win. We simply have to find out who we can pit against each other. And in 1968, he said, now, Nixon, we can't win if we act like Barry Goldwater. We can't win if we act like... Uh, Wallace, because it's not 1954 anymore, so you can't use the N-word. So he said, let's come up with a way that we can talk about racial politics without sounding racial. So they decided the new language would be tax cuts. <laughs> States' rights against forced busing, law and order. And later on, Lee Atwater, before he died of throat cancer, you know, he had this interview and somebody asked him, he said, yeah, that was the Southern strategy. He said, you talk about all of these things and they sound benign. They sound as though they have no racialized um, implication. You're just doing what's best for the country. He said, but behind it all, you hurt blacks and other minorities, but more importantly, you get working class white people to vote against their own self-interest. Hmm? So this is not about a balanced budget. It's actually about reversed, a reverse Robin Hood budget that takes from the needy, gives to the greedy. It's about bad economic trickle-down theory that fails every time. Not fails one time, but fails every time. One writer said it like this. They are comfortable putting the squeeze on working families who will be most affected, not just working families, but the poor. Not the poor, the poor. How many of my brothers and sisters from the hood know what I'm talking about? Diff <laughs> See, some folk, you know, I even say this sometimes when you have sometimes Democratic and other politicians, and they like to, you know, they give in. They don't want to use the language poor. So they say, well, we're trying to fight for those people who are working to make it into the middle class. Some people are not working to make it into the middle class. Some people are just trying to protect what Jesus rode into Jerusalem on. Start with an A. That's, that's, they're just trying to protect their every day. That's all. They're just trying to make it. And that's why we don't need to come up with cute phrases. We need to talk about the poor. I go to progressive conferences, and nobody even uses the language poor. 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 Then they want to do this by cutting benefits and services, but they refuse to ask corporations and the wealthy to contribute one thin dime to the effort. This is nothing but Adam Smith's idea uh, of social and political and economic Darwinism, survival of the fittest. And if they do this, it's going to create one trillion dollar hole in the budget, which is going to disable the government for doing what we, the people, need the government to do. You said, I thought you were going to talk about Loretta Lynch. We in class. Stay with me. <laughs> this same crowd also wants to loose payday lenders. Mm -hmm. And they want to undermine any kind of regulations that stand on behalf and fight for the rights of everyday people. So budgets are about choices. And the extremists who call themselves Republicans have chosen in their budget to further enrich the wealthy and corporations at the expense of workers, children, veterans, seniors. Say that with me. Say workers, workers. Children, children, veterans, veterans seniors. seniors. The whole American family for their budget, remember where your treasure, that's where your heart is, their budget is a budget not for the people, not by the people, and not of the people. Now, how do I know that? Because polls have been done that says that education, energy and environment, housing, 
protecting people from, uh, from, from predatory lending, job training, infrastructure, climate change, and the economy are the top priorities for Americans, for Americans. 70% of Americans oppose the deep cuts in the SNAP program. 62% believe all states should expand Medicaid and it's encouraged under the Affordable Care Act. 67% say that we ought to be putting more money in public education. And yet, according to this extreme budget and the extreme policies, they, they are suggesting to us, and this is what they're selling to America. If you want a great America, you really want a great America, this is how you get there. Cut public education and go after teachers. Deny health, you really want a great America? Deny health care to Americans. You really want a great America? Uh, uh, cut earned income tax credit and deny long-term unemployment. If not, if you really want a great America, just let these lenders do whatever they want. If you really want a great America, rob workers of workers' rights. If you really want a great America, call the president juvenile, call him childish, fight him on everything, even when he bends over backwards to, to, to bring you in. And if you really, really, really want a great America, if you really want a great America, then undermine voting rights. Undermine voter. If you really want a great America, turn religions against each other and talk about the Muslim community like you used to talk about black men back in the days of slavery and Jim Crow when, the, when they would say all black men are brute and predisposed to criminal activity. And then after you've done this and created all of this division and cynicism, if you really want a great America, make sure that everybody can get a gun quicker than they can register to vote. That's their agenda. That's the agenda. And we've, we've got to, we have to begin to explain it like that. Ted Cruz laid it out. Imagine an America. That wasn't imagination, because imagination is going forward. That was a nightmare that he suggested, and then had the nerve to do it at a so-called Christian college when nothing he talked about was Christian, because Christianity says, when I was hungry, feed me. When I was naked, clothe me. Now, if that's your agenda, and 67 and 70% of Americans don't agree with it when they really understand what you're doing, how can you promote this vision when you can't win elections nationally? Ask your neighbor, say, what's going on? Okay. You have to find a way to cheat. So you can't win nationally. That you, President Obama has proven that 12, eight years. So you have to find a way to cheat at the state level. Watch me now. I'm getting the lynch. Just watch. In order to get people in office who will vote narrowly. So you basically give up the national election. I mean, you run candidates, but you're not expecting because once most people hear what you're selling, they're not going to buy it. So you gotta find a way to get people in the office who will vote narrowly. Now remember 1974, Charles Koch gave a speech in which he said we were no, they were gonna no longer invest in Messiah candidates nationally. They were gonna invest in movement building at the state level. They were gonna build a radio talk host, they were gonna build think tanks, and they were gonna create language, and they were gonna build from the bottom up. Many progressives decided we were gonna invest in candidacies and not movement building. We were going to invest in Messiah candidates and not movement building. And when the candidate loses, we then all the infrastructure leaves. And when the candidate wins, we then turn everything over to the candidate as though they can do it all. So Charles Koch and that side took what Dr. King told us to do. They took it from us and, and used that, Dr. King's good dream for wrong purposes. You remember? Dr. King told us at the end of his speech, 1963, go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back and build state movements, because you've never changed D.C. from D.C. D.C. has always been changed from the bottom up, Greensboro, Selma, Birmingham, that's how you change this country. But if you can't win nationally, you have to cheat. Now, how do you cheat? First thing you have to do is promote race-based redistricting. 
that stacks and packs and bleaches black voters to keep them not from electing black folk, but from building alliances with progressive whites to elect blacks and whites who will be against this radical extreme agenda. Well, that's what they did all over the South. Did it in North Carolina. Now, just yesterday, five to four, the Supreme Court held that packing black voters to meet a specific racial quota is constitutionally suspect. So that redistricting piece is on its way out now. It lasts, but, it, but it's already done a lot of its effect. See, it's done, it did a lot of damage, you know. But, but the, even the court, Kennedy had to go on the other side, not with the liberal justice, but with the justices who were right. <laughs> and the only one that was squealing was Thomas uh, Clarence Thomas, of all people. If I was in church, one of the mothers would say, Lord, help him. <laughs> Not help him, help him. <laughs> All right? Now, so, so if you can't cheat with redistricting, the next way you cheat is voter suppression. Watch me now. Especially in the South. Why? Because, because while the Southern strategy has worked for the last 40-some years, and the South is solid, it's no longer solid anymore. And the election of President Obama in 2008 and 2012 proved that because he won in places like South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. And we know now that Georgia and Mississippi, with the demographic shifts, if everybody can vote and there's not suppression, uh-oh, uh-oh, the South is no longer solid. And you, don't, and you can't guarantee the election of politicians, particularly from the South, who are going to be against public education and against regulation on, on, on payday lenders and against the attacks on housing. In fact, we know now that if you just register 30% of the unregistered black voters or other minority voters like Latinos or Asian, then what you're gonna have is a brand new South. The political calculus will shift. And if the political calculus shifts in the South, it changes the nation. And if it changes the nation, then you won't have the people in the Congress that are passing these crazy extremist budgets because they won't be able to win at home. So to promote this extreme agenda uh, that cuts housing and health and, and all of these other matters, you have to find a way to violate the 15th Amendment. I'm going somewhere now. The 15th Amendment says this, the right of citizens of the United States shall not be denied or abridged. Not just denied. See, because James Crow Esquire doesn't try to deny your right to vote. They attempt to abridge your right to vote, which is another way of denying your right to vote. The 14th Amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of a citizen of the United States or shall deny equal protection under the law. So if you're going to cheat, you got to find a way to undermine the 15th and the 14th Amendment because unless you cheat, you can't win the Congress, you can't win state houses, and if you can't win state houses, you can't implement your extreme agenda because you know you can't win a national race. Touch your neighbor and say, I wonder where he's going. <laughs> watch me now, watch me now. Now, in order to violate these two laws without immediate examination, voter suppression laws, redistricting laws, if, if you gotta find a way, I mean, they might 10, 20 years prove that they're wrong, but if you want to have immediate impact without any immediate uh, review, then you have to, number one, gut the Voting Rights Amendment. They have a voting rights amendment section five out there because then you're gonna have preclearance. And if you have preclearance, then, the, then a national attorney general will be able to stop your cheating before it's implemented. Y'all with me? So you, so you get the Supreme Court has got a gut section five, and then the Congress has to stall on fixing section four, the formula, so section five is no longer implemented. But in North Carolina, when Section 4, when the Supreme Court gutted uh, sec, uh, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act in June of 2013, one of our legislators told us, 
just said, now that the headache has been removed. Think about that. The Voting Rights Act was passed because of the blood of Mega Evers, the blood of four little girls in a Birmingham church, the blood of Viola Wusa, a white woman from, from Detroit, the blood of James Reed from Washington, D.C. But this legislator on, in the paper said, now that the headache, in other words, I was getting a headache trying to figure out how to cheat with this Voting Rights Act, but now I don't have to worry. And what did they do? Within 35 days, they passed the worst voter suppression bill in North Carolina that we've seen since, the ninth, since Jim Crow. They passed the worst redistricting we've seen since the 19th century. And they set up a model for the rest of the South. But, 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 what else do you have to do? Even if you don't have the Voting Rights Act, there's still an agency out there that has legal authority to challenge voter suppression tactics using Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Any lawyers in here? Raise your hand, lawyers. Am I doing all right for a jack leg lawyer? Okay, y'all, yeah, all right. So, so, because you got this agency out here, uh, uh, and, and this agency not only can, infor can, can sue based on Section 2, this agency can challenge payday lenders. Huh? And enforce federal law. All right. Now, this little, this little agency is called the U.S. Department of Justice. So if you're going to cheat, you got to gut the Voting Rights Act, but you got to find some way to destabilize the Justice Department. Because the Justice Department is the federal, let me read it right from the book, is the federal executive department of the U.S. government responsible for the enforcement of law and administration of justice in the United States. Top law officer. Now, what would make you, if you were an, what would make a person or a politician willing to weaken this nation's ability to deal with terrorism? Because that law, what, what's, more, what's, what's more important to you than dealing with terrorists? Could it be cheating and getting elected so you can promote your extreme agenda? I don't know. I'm just saying what's going on. Huh? So, so if you have an agenda of voter suppression for your own political purposes, you can't really afford to have a stabilized Justice Department. And the one way you destabilize an office of the federal government is either to defund it or deny leadership. And here's where the race question comes in, John. It's not that they are denying Loretta Lynch because she's black. Because if she was black and Clarence Thomas, she would have got confirmed. <laughs> huh? It's not that she's black. It's the kind of black she, they suspect she might be. A black person with integrity. A black person that will enforce the law. A black person that understands the history of discrimination and will be... be a black person that will be as tough on high co white collar crimes and as tough on terrorists as, and as, as tough on, on the, them as she is on enforcement of the 14th and the 15th Amendment of the Constitution. And if you are going to cheat, you can't have a good teacher that's going to walk around the classroom while you're taking the test. You want a lazy teacher that's going to sit at the desk or either go out of the room and act like nothing's going on. <laughs> Help me a little bit, Mr. Mike, man. See, I, I would disagree with Mr. Durbin. It's not that they want her at the back of the bus. I understand the analogy. They want the entire function of the Justice Department at the back of the bus. They want it at the back of the bus if they cannot guarantee that the leadership will not go after these voter suppression. They want the office destabilized, and they certainly uh, do not want a strong, overly qualified black woman who they think does not agree with their fundamental violations of the 14th Amendment 
who they know is tough and a no-nonsense person that would vigorously enforce the law, especially now if she was given the power to do so. And that's the race question. It's not as simple as black. The race question comes in because without strong enforcement of the law of the 14th and 15th Amendment and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, states can pass voter suppression laws that are biased and discriminatory toward blacks, Latinos, and women, and the poor. And when these laws are passed that impact voting, it allows Congress people and senators at the state level to get in office through trickery and cheating that vote against every issue that groups like the National Reinvestment Coalition cares about. That's the race issue. Race is not about persons, it's about policy. Systemic, institutionalized racism. And that's why we gotta analyze this and understand what's going on. It, because denying Loretta Lynch and denying fixing the Voting Rights Act allows the Southern strategy to still hold the country back. Now how do I know this? Because Tom Tillis said it. All you gotta do is listen to him. He, he, he didn't mean, he, didn't, he wasn't supposed to say it, but he was too whatever to keep his mouth closed. See, it used to be when you were a freshman senator, you shut up. But he, he, he just, you know, you know, he thought he won in North Carolina when actually he only got 49% of the vote, 51% of the people voted against him, and we can trace 100,000 votes that were suppressed, which, which, which basically uh, caused them to win. If, if, they, we had, if, if the, if the, if the um, Supreme Court had not denied our injunction against the voter suppression laws, it would have been a very different election in North Carolina. So he's filling his cheerio, so he's talking too much. <laughs> and so at one of the hearings, he asked Loretta Lynch about her position on voting laws. He wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> See? Yeah. And, and, and about the laws that were passed in his state that are now being challenged in the court, that the Fourth Circuit of the, of the federal courts has already said are unconstitutional in our injunction. And when we go to court on July the 6th, we believe we're gonna win it. Tillis was Speaker of the House. He was the backer of the law. He pushed the laws. 40 changes, ended early voting, ended same day registration, put in the worst voter ID in the country, worse than Alabama, worse than South Carolina. Even a federal Republican judge in Indiana is now saying he was wrong on voter ID. So what question does he ask Loretta Lynch? Where do you stand? Why? Because when you're cheating, you got to make sure you can't just have anybody enforcing the law. Huh? He said, I'm concerned that you said in a speech uh, on Martin Luther King Day when, you, when she said, I'm proud to tell you that the Department of Justice is looking into these laws. That's what the Department of Justice is supposed to do. And he's questioning her because really, if you're cheating, you don't want anybody to look. Right. And so they also at that same hearing called Catherine Engelbrecht, the founding president of True the Vote, a Tea Party link group that has trained advocates so-called to look out for voting. You're like, no, it's a Tea Party group that's trying to figure out more ways to cheat. Now think about that. Loretta Lynch is being, going through confirmation hearings. You basically ask her, are you going to enforce the law? Which is what she's being co confirmed to do. And then you bring into the same hearing somebody that's trying to undermine the law. Huh? What's going on? What's going on? That's the race question. Is there denial because she's black? No. She ain't the right black person. The, the real denial is that she could be white, for that matter, but they do not want a strong attorney general. 
that will continue the legacy of Eric Holder, and that is not interpreting the law as the Supreme Court does, but enforcing the law as it is. And as I see it, the, and you should see it too, the 15th Amendment that, that says you cannot deny and abridge the right to vote, and the 14th Amendment that says you must guarantee equal protection under the law is still the law of the land, and I want a top cop that will enforce that law. So in essence, Tom Tillis and Senator Burr and others support laws that are being proven every day that are racially and class discriminatory. And they do not want, touch your neighbor say, and they do not want. No, say it like you mean it. I know it's going to say they do not want. They do not want. They do not want a top law enforcement officer to be on the side of enforcing the law in a way that doesn't allow people to cheat, that cause, that undermines minorities, blacks, and, and, and women, and the poor people that right to vote, because if everybody votes, they can't win. And if they can't win, they can't loose pay their lenders. If they can't win, they can't pass these regressive budgets. If they can't win, they can't take money from public education and route that money into their private investors. If they can't win, they can't take the regulations off of the banking industry. You see what I'm saying? And if they, and if they, but if they can do those things, they create discrimination. That's the race issue. Now, as I close, what does this mean for a conference like this? It means of all the things you are discussing here, you must join the fight for a real fix to the Voting Rights Act if you are truly concerned about reinvestment in this country and the policies that are passed. Because without Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, it will continue to allow, especially in the South, Congress people and state legislators to be elected without adequate challenge that are diametrically opposed to everything you care about. Secondly, you must make sure that you don't get hoodwinked, bamboozled, run amok. <clears throat> right now, there's a proposed fix of the Voting Rights Act in Congress called the Sensenbrenner Bill. It is bad. It's a Washington development. It is not something that was developed by us, the people down south. Do you know if that bill was passed today, and they so-called fixed the voting section for the Voting Rights Act. Do you know Selma, Alabama wouldn't be covered? That was covered 50 years ago. Do you know Mississippi would only be covered for a year, Texas only a year, North Carolina wouldn't be covered, South Carolina where they still fly the Confederate flag wouldn't be covered, Tennessee wouldn't be covered, Virginia wouldn't be covered. That's not a fix, that's a farce. And that's the worst thing we can allow, is for them to promote a fix politically that's not really a fix. Take the issue off the table when it needs to be done properly. So this conference and people like you who are engaged across this country, you need to, you need to double and triple your efforts to get involved in fixing the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act fix is not about black people. It's about America. White women could not even sit on juries before the Voting Rights Act was fixed. Progressive white candidates could not win in the South until the Voting Rights Act was implemented. So you cannot separate these. Well, I'm concerned about reinvestment. The NAACP is concerned about voting rights. Hell, all of us better be concerned about voting rights. Now, 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 secondly, and I'm going to my seat. You must also double and triple your efforts for the confirmation of Loretta Lynch. And, 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 and all the black women, raise your hand. Now, turn, hold them up. Now, turn to the others and say, she your sister, too. <laughs> this can't be about just black women. This got to be about justice. Huh? Justice, justice. Because, because her confirmation 
and having the U.S. Justice Department stabilized and able to enforce the laws of this land, not only 1450, but all of the federal laws and protection that so many of you have fought for. Her confirmation is key, is key. Whatever you're fighting for, no strong Voting Rights Act, you're not going to get the policies that you want. Whatever you're fighting for, no strong attorney general, you're not going to have an enforcement agency that's going to be able to hold these states and others' feet to the fire when they try to roll back the rights that you have fought for. Unchecked voter suppression that allows extremists, especially in the South, to win by default and trickery and cheating and thereby stack the Congress and state houses with those that are diametrically opposed to your justice and the kind of fairness you believe in must be challenged. Must be challenged. And so, John, I'm kind of glad you called me out of sabbatical because I've been thinking about all this stuff in the library. And I just wanted y'all to think with me. I haven't fully developed this, but hope I did a little bit all right. I, um, I want you to know that I believe that this is our fight 50 years after Selma. Our fight is not to win voting rights, but to hold on to the rights that were already won. See, really, we ought to be talking about now making it sure you're registered to vote when you register for the draft automatically. That's what we really ought to be talking about. We really ought to be talking about a constitutional amendment that, le that, that lays out voting patterns that are equalized across the board, and we have a constitutional right to a certain way of, of, of voting rather than having each state going through all of this trickery. But instead of that, our fight right now is just to hold on. And our fight now is to guarantee strong enforcement of the laws and, and civil rights, the laws that we've already won. And we can win this fight together. You need to understand as I go to my seat, you don't cheat when somebody's weaker than you. Wish I had a witness here. <laughs> you only cheat when you know you can't beat them in a head-on battle. And I'm going around the country saying to progressives, it's time for us to stop talking about how strong the Tea Party is and how strong that these extremists are. They know how strong you are. That's why they cheat so much. And the faith I come from says if you're right, one can chase a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. The, the Bible that I read says justice can roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. My faith tradition tells me you can have a bad Friday. You can get beat down on Friday and crucified on Friday and knocked down on Friday. But if you hang in there, yeah, that's Sunday morning. I'm here to tell you. Hmm. So you got to do everything you can do right now. We need mass mobilization today like we had it 50 years ago. President Johnson said on March 15, 1965, the real hero of the struggle is the American Negro. His actions, his protests, his courage to risk safety and even risk life have awakened the consciousness of this nation. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, we must awaken the conscience of this nation. One more time. It's our time, y'all. And we can do this together. I want you to understand it's time for us to stop moping. Stop coming to these conferences talking about how strong the Tea Party is and start talking about how strong we are when we work together. Don't you remember Selma? Oh, my God. They won against dogs. They won against assassination. They won against beatings. They won against the Ku Klux Klan. And if they won against all that, who in the hell is scared of tea? Who? Who? The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If they could win, then surely we can win now. Dr. King on March 25th, this past Wednesday, 
stood on the steps of the Capitol in Montgomery, the place where the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, had been inaugurated. He stood there looking from, that, from that, those steps across the Dexter Avenue where he had started his ministry 1956, nine years earlier. And Dr. King said on that day, the 25th, the president had already given his speech and placed the Voting Rights Act before the Congress. And Dr. King said, they said, we would never get here but over their dead bodies. But here we are. And we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. I wonder are there any fighters in here that'll touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. And then Dr. King said, and I want to lift his words, and then I want to remix them. He said, I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody saying, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men and darken their understanding and drive bright-eyed wisdom from their sacred throne? Somebody's asking, asking, when will wounded justice? lying prostrate on the streets of Selma and Birmingham and communities all over the South, be lifted from the dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. How long? And then Dr. King said, I want to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed to the earth will rise again. How long? Not long because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you will reap what you sow. How long? Not long, because truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. How long? Not long, because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. I want to remix and update Dr. King's question. How long? Will the Tea Party influence the trajectory of American politics? Not long. <laughs> if we come together and dilute that tea and fight back like we ought to. How long? Will voter suppression tactics work? Not long if we mobilize in mass and vote in mass and litigate in mass. How long? Will extremist politicians terrorize the political landscape? Not long if reinvestment advocates and civil rights advocates and voting advocates and housing advocates and public education advocates and labor advocates and Black Lives Matter advocates and women advocates and LGBTQ advocates, if we all come together, not long, not long, not long, not long, when we all Come together, what a day, what a day, what a day, what a day of rejoicing it will be, and it's not long. Not long, Reverend. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Lift my hand up. Not long. Not long. Thank you so much. Thank you.